You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that app. Well, first of all, a uh, big thank you to Mr. J.J. Leahy. I mentioned to everybody yesterday um, that I would not be doing the podcast. I was planning to. I was uh, out of town, and um, there's just a lot going on. And I was like, I just I don't feel like taking the laptop and sitting in the van for an hour and a half doing the podcast, so I was just going to cancel it. And then it dawned on me that I had kind of kicked around the idea of having just guest hosts. So I just talked to JJ about it, and he's like, yeah, I can do it today if you want. So there you go. That's what happened yesterday, for those that are wondering how that all came to be. I also uh, had mentioned to him that the full plan is to have different guest hosts at different times, because I just think that would be kind of a fun little feature to get different people in here whenever the, you know the time arises. However, knowing myself, I will put no effort into finding and securing other talent to fill in on the show. Things will come up last minute. I will reach out to JJ last minute. He will graciously do the show last minute, and that's how that'll go. But um, anyways, shout out to Mr. JJ. Um, it has been a very long day. We just got home. Uh, it's 9 o'clock at night, and again, I'm, I'm really not used to being up, so I, I don't anticipate this being a long episode. I want to hit on some stuff. Got a lot of questions, some news. ba ba ba. Good to go. Wrap it up. Although. I did just down a monster, and I'm not even that tired, so I'm kind of scared that I'm going to be up real late tonight, because it's like, I should drink this because I'm going to get tired, but I'm not tired. So what happens when you're not tired at 9 o'clock and you slam a monster? I don't know. We'll find out. Probably going to be binge-watching Hoarders until 2 in the morning is, is realistically what's about to happen. But I am very, very excited because the draft is rapidly closing in, and so I'm real excited that we... Uh, very, very soon are going to be able to sit back and see who the newest and latest and greatest Green Bay Packers are going to be. I want to remind you that we've got a fun little competition going on. I posted it, I think, on Twitter, on Facebook, all over the place. Basically, you join at uh, predictpick.nfl.com. There's a group. Again, find the group in the Facebook group, I think. But you just click it. You enter the password Packernet. And then all you got to do is do a mock draft, something that most of you guys have been doing a thousand times anyways. And what NFL.com is going to do is they're going to score it based on how well you predicted it. And we're going to be giving away some hefty prizes, probably somewhere in the ballpark of $200 worth of prizes to the first, second, and third place winners. So as of right now, there are 11 people in here. I'm giving away $200 worth of stuff and I can get 11 people in here. You guys are getting ridiculous. You cannot, you cannot be that lazy. Click the link, type in Packernet for a chance to win uh, $200 in prizes. I know it's the weekend. At least it has been the weekend. But today is Monday. I will post it again. Click the link. All right? You guys are ridiculous. Just went to check and there's 11 people in here. Sorry to the 11 people for your 30% chance of getting a $50 gift card. But (laughs) I'd like to get this a little bit bigger. That's what, well, never mind. So why don't we start with the news that was from several days ago um, that I kind of just don't even care about anymore, but it was big news at the time. Orlando Brown is now a Kansas City Chief. I'm I'm very upset because they got him way too cheap. I don't know how one of the best tackles in football goes to one of the best teams in football for basically a second-round pick. No, they gave up a first-round pick. Uh, Yeah, they had to give back a bunch of stuff too, though. If you do the math... It's the equivalent of, like, pick 44 overall is about what they gave up. A second-round pick for a right tackle. That is, what, 22 years old? No, no, he's, he's almost 25. Eh, well, shows what I know. I guess he is going into his fourth year. It still just seems crazy to me, though. I mean, we, we are assuming that with the first pick, because they cut both of their tackles, their first pick was probably going to be a tackle. And the hope is that eventually you're going to be able to find Orlando Brown. They basically just picked up Orlando Brown, who's still on his rookie contract. And I know a lot of people are making a big deal about, well, now they're going to have to pay him. I get that it's nice to be able to have guys on rookie contracts and stuff. But at the end of the day, if you have good players, you have to pay them. If you got the space, just pick them up and pay them what they're worth, right? Like, for example, 
we could cut David Bakhtiari and draft a tackle, but that would be stupid. Why? Because the goal is to get a really good tackle and then pay them a bunch of money because they're really, really good. The Chiefs just got that for a second round pick. I just, it's just, it's, I don't know. Now, is he going to be a good football player? I don't know. This is a very, very different situation. First of all, he's a year older, which is a thing. He's always been good, not great. So his grades, 68, 73, and then 77. I know I say one of the best, and, and he is. I mean, he is very good. I mean, very good pass blocker in the 80s or whatever. The biggest switch, though, is he's going from the, the number one rushing team in football to the number three passing team in football. The Baltimore Ravens run more than any team in all of football. The Chiefs were 23rd in rushing attempts. Not only that, the Baltimore Ravens are a power or gap rushing team. More than any team in the NFL by far, almost 75% of the time, three quarters of the time, they're running power and not zone. The Chiefs are about 70% zone. On top of that, he's going from right tackle to left tackle. I have no idea what's going to happen. And to be honest, that's probably a big part of the reason why he was only worth a second-round pick. Not that a second-round pick isn't worth something, but if you're talking about a guy that can be a, a, a tackle for the next five, six, seven years, I mean, I, I hate to bring Bakhtiari back into this, but what could he have commanded, even at an older age? Well beyond a first-round pick. Even being older, even being injured and not even starting the season, he would have gotten beyond a first-round pick. So I guess, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. It is sort of strange that um, the Chiefs didn't want to work out a longer contract. My thought is, similar to everything else, they kind of want to wait and see how it goes. Sort of incentive-based. Yes, we can probably get them a little bit cheaper if we had worked out an extension prior to bringing him on. But we also don't know how this is going to pan out. So if it goes really, really well, he's worth that extra premium that we're going to be paying. If he doesn't, then we got him for a year on a rookie contract and we can move on. And since he was, I believe, I think he was, a, let me check. No, so I, yeah, ne never mind. Scrap that. I thought I had another thought, but I, I did not. All right, let's start ripping through some questions here. Going to be going through questions from patrons. This one from Steve Waltering says, do the Packers and all teams contact each other earlier in the weeks before the draft to let others know that they may be willing to trade up or down and what it might take to pull it off. Seven minutes on the clock doesn't give teams time to offer and accept deals. Um, yes. I have no idea to what extent, but as, as we've already seen, some deals have already been done. We've seen, uh, you know, the three-way trade with Miami and San Francisco and whoever, Eagles. Um, so yeah, th there's, there's some jockeying around. I, I would assume that there's also some, cause, cause everybody wants to be able to be nimble and also probably throw some smoke and everything else in different directions, get a feel for certain teams, what they might be doing. I'm sure there's all kinds of gamesmanship and positioning and jockeying and all that. So yeah, I, I think that there is some general understanding of those kinds of things so that they, you know, in other words, if you contact a team and say, Hey, if this is the case, we may be interested in this, that, or the other, when that team comes up that you talk to, they might be waiting for your phone call, ready for your phone call. So you can just pick it up and be like, all right, I want to do it. And like you said, seven minutes isn't a lot of time. So if you've got some of that worked out, you know, you cut out some of that negotiation time. Let's say we wanted to get up to 20. We talk to the team that's at 20. They let us know we are willing, you know, because we just want to know because we, we, you know, you go through all these different scenarios. And as you go through these scenarios, you might look at it and go, dude, if this, this guy might make it to 20. And if he does, we, we might want to pull the trigger. And so you just start getting the idea of what cost is going to be. So you talk to the guys at 20. They let you know, we're not going to do it for less than this. And you're thinking, all right, that's not a bad price. So then the guy does make it. You don't have to tell him who the guy is. You just He just made it. So you make the phone call. You know what the price is. And you're like, hey, I'm ready to pull the trigger. What do you think? You know, and they can go back on it and say, yeah, I'll, I want more or, or let's do the deal or whatever. But Yes, I, I do think it makes a lot of sense. And again, I don't know to what degree that that happens, but I know that that does happen. Question from Danny. He says, I've heard some talk about, he says, JV on Collins. I'm guessing you mean Zavin Collins. I'd like to know your thoughts about the Packers going linebacker in the first round and your thoughts on Zavin Collins in particular. Again, if you mean JV on Collins, then you're going to have to elaborate because I don't know anybody by that name. I, you know, I... I... <sighs> I can't answer the question because I don't know the internal discussions with the Green Bay Packers. I don't have, you know, the, the question comes down to value. 
it's always about value. No matter the team, no matter the round, no matter what, it's, it's just about value. And so in order to understand value, you have to have context. What is the value of a brand new iPhone compared to a bottle of water? Well, that's simple. I can just Google it and uh, here's the value of this and here's the value of that and we can kind of generalize it. But what if I ask you that question on a deserted island? There's no cell phone service. There's no electricity. There's no internet. The heck good does, it, does an app, Apple iPhone do for you? Compare that to a bottle of water. Suddenly, just that one little tweak, the bottle of water is actually more valuable than an Apple iPhone. The, the iPhone has no value. Go, go back in time to the year 1204. What's more valuable, an Apple iPhone or a bottle of water? It's water. The, the iPhone is useless. And so in order to understand how good of a pick Zayvon Collins would be, it's beyond fit, and it's beyond just a general understanding of, of linebacker value. It's about how much value does linebacker have in Joe Barry's system? And again, I don't know the answer to that question. I've been told that there's a lot. Some people tend to think it's more of a safety role, you know, getting a third safety kind of thing. I, I don't know. I know that historically the Packers couldn't give two you-know-whats about linebackers, and to think that they would take a linebacker in the first round, even if we didn't have one, which we haven't in a very long time, is a joke. And, and that's not to say that they never would, that Ted Thompson never would, or that Mike Pettin would never want that if they genuinely thought, hey, the best guy by far on the board is a linebacker, that they wouldn't take him. But the question really for me is, has something changed to the degree, and I've said this a thousand times, to where Joe Barry goes to Brian Gutekunst and says, if you want me to run the scheme the way that I need to, I have to have a linebacker that can do X, Y, Z. In that case, the discussion shifts from the only way they take Zayvon Collins is if they have a you know elite grade on him and, and he's the highest on the board by far, right? Th- this is sort of, if this was last year, in other words, Joe Barry is not our defensive coordinator, so we have a good understanding of what the defense is under Mike Pettin. The only way Zayvon Collins would get drafted is if the way they have them graded, as I said, with tiers, Zayvon Collins is on a tier all by himself, and the Packers are like, all right, let's just take him. He's clearly the best available. Today, though, you change that discussion if those conversations are taking place. And again, I don't know, which is why I can't answer the question. If those conversations are taking place, it goes from that, where, in other words, the only way Zayvon goes is if he's by far the best, to... They could not only look at it and say, there's seven guys on one tier. We got a wide receiver, a linebacker, da, 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 and we're taking Zavin because that's the most important thing that we need. Or possibly even we should trade up because it's a must. We know we don't need another wide receiver. We know we technically don't need an offensive lineman, although we, it's pretty close. We know we don't need a corner because we had Jair and Kevin King and Chandon last year. It's the exact same group. But if Joe Barry walks into the office and says, I need somebody that can do this job, suddenly it becomes very, very important. But again, I don't know. I have no idea what the discussions are. I don't know what Joe Barry has told them about how he's going to run his defense, what pieces are missing. I I don't know. As I've said, I I think for the most part, people that are telling you that they do know are not entirely true. Not that they're not informed guesses based on what either Joe Barry has done in the past or guys that he's worked with or worked for have done in the past, fine. But different situation, different scenario, different everything. Um, We kind of just have to wait and find out unless he just comes out and tells us. Now, with that in mind, I'm a huge fan of Zavin, not because of necessarily anything I've seen, although I did watch a little bit of Zavin Collins. Um, I think the competition level is part of the reason I don't even trust my own evaluation, which is that I like him. I I hate watching guys in small schools because they always look awesome. They always look dominant because they are. They're basically D1 players playing for D2 schools. That's not entirely the reality, but you get what I'm saying, right? It's, it's, of course, they're dominant, but the question is, what are they going to do in the NFL? And that requires another level of evaluation that I just can't do. I don't know how to quantify that. But the thing that blows me away is how much of a freak this guy is. We're talking about a, a... 93 overall coverage grade at six foot four, 260 pounds. He's a massive, massive human being. And, and keep in mind, something else to remember, um, he had a 90 overall pass rush grade, and some people are talking about uh, possibly even putting him as an edge rusher. Again, 6'4", 260, he's built big enough to be that. 
But you, you're talking about a big, massive human being that could possibly be an edge rusher, or at the very least you would assume is just a, a run-stuffing monster whose biggest asset is coverage. And as three years at cover, uh, at Tulsa, that's always been his number one asset. His run defense is, is mediocre. It's just the ability that he has at his size to be able to do those kinds of things is really remarkable. And regardless of the school he went to, he's kind of a freak. 14 targets, 11 receptions, one touchdown given up, four interceptions, one pass breakup. He was targeted 14 times and caught four picks. What was that like 30% of the times he's targeted, he caught the, the ball? 29%? I don't, I don't know. It just That's, that's kind of silly. The entire year, 11 receptions, 59 yards. In three of those games, there were either zero or less yards given up. Only two games did he give up more than, uh, well, one game he gave up more than 10 yards. Against Tulane, also the only game in which he gave up more than two receptions, five targets, four receptions, 46 yards, gave up a touchdown, but also had a pick in that game. That was by far his worst in terms of coverage. Oklahoma State, one target, one reception, negative eight yards. Against Navy, two targets, one reception, negative two yards. So, I mean, I like the the prospect of a six foot four, two hundred and sixty pound guy that can fly around the field, but can he fly for a Tulsa guy? Or can he fly as an NFL prospect? Because if, if you put him in the NFL and he's just another guy, then I mean then, then he's just another guy, right? Because he's not gonna be able to cover anybody. So I, I don't know. I know that he is a freak, and I think generally speaking, most people see him as a freak, and I think he's going to go relatively early for that reason. Um, but as far as will the Packers take him again, it really just comes down to whatever those conversations are. If there's a change in philosophy for linebacker, I think that increases the opportunity or the odds that we end up taking a guy like Zayvon Collins or another linebacker earlier than we would have in the past. If not, then it goes down to what it's always been, which is the only way we take a linebacker early is if, you know, they're by far the best prospect on the board that's available. Anyways, um, I think we're going to take a break here. Again, this is probably going to be a pretty short episode. I also wanted to mention, now that I'm recording at nighttime, one of the extra things that I'm going to be doing as a perk, if you're interested, I'm going to be uploading these episodes to Patreon, meaning tonight, which is Sunday, I'm going to upload this episode on Patreon and then go over to the hosting company and schedule this for tomorrow, which is Monday. So patrons will be able to listen to these episodes a day earlier. So if you're up at, you know, 10 o'clock at night and you want to get a jump start on the podcast, you can do so. Can't promise that'll be every day. Obviously, when JJ is doing it and whatnot, that's not going to be a thing. But uh, I'm going to try to do that as an extra added perk. If you're interested in something like that, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. You can join for as little as a dollar per month. Speaking of, big giant shout out to Spencer Haka and Mikey on mute. Thank you both for jumping in on Patreon as of yesterday. Very much appreciate that. That puts us at, I believe, 11 patrons. I I've, Seems like I maybe set my sights a little too um, too small, if that's the right way to say that. But that's fine. If we can get to 200 patrons before the start of the season, that's uh, I'm not going to be mad about it, even if I probably should have set the sights higher. But uh, we'll take a break, and then we can just kind of run through the rest of these questions, and I'm going to go binge hoarders. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. 
What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. All right, speaking of Mikey on mute, he had a question in the Patreon, uh, Packernet Patreon Discord. Do you think Goot has thrown out the Ted way of home-growing players, or is the league just more of an impact now focus? Seems like everyone wants immediate results. I think the spectrum has moved a bit. I don't think Ted Thompson would have done what Brian Gutekunst did when he got in. That is Zadarius and Preston and Amos and Turner. Very, very aggressive. And not just getting guys, but getting big time names. You also hear him in conversations a lot more than you ever heard Ted. Um, Even when they don't pull the trigger, um, you know, guys like Fuller, the Packers are in on those discussions, whereas Ted, maybe he would have called, but probably not. Snacks Harrison. I don't think that that would have happened. Now, the other side of that. The reason we're in trouble right now is because of that kind of a thing. I don't think Ted Thompson would have gotten us into this cap mess that we're in. That's just part of the territory. That's why I get really frustrated with people who are mad at Goot for not going all in. No, 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 no. Excuse me. You don't get to play both sides of this. You don't get to beg and kick and scream and say, why won't we go all in? And then we go all in. And it doesn't work, and you say, why won't we go all in? No, 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 we did, and it didn't work. Now you, just like Gutekunst, have to own it. And I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. We still got the guys, we still got an opportunity, but there is a lot of risk involved. And again, you, you just, you, it's okay if you want the Packers to do it, but you got to own this. The fact that you wanted it and you got it and it didn't work, you have to own it. The fact that we are in a cap mess, the fact that we're not signing any free agents because we have no money, that's because of you, not that you directly impacted it, but your strategy, the thing that you've been begging for for a decade, the thing that you couldn't stand Ted Thompson for, why won't he just go get help? Why won't he da 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 He did. We stacked this team with talent. And not only did he go out and get guys, but it worked. This is one of the few times, usually you go out and pay big time money for free agents and they're garbage. He went out and got Zedarius and Zedarius was the best pass rusher in football. He went out and got Amos and Amos is one of the top safeties in football. Preston was decent, but you know, Turner, fine. Now, anyways, without getting too derailed here, getting back to your question, has he completely thrown out Ted's Ted's ways? I don't think so. Again, I think we're shifting the paradigm a bit. We're shifting the spectrum. And, and part of that probably isn't 100% Gutekunst is just 100% different than Ted. It's also because we're in a different situation now. We're, we're closer to Rodgers being to the end of his career, and it's like we, we got to kind of make a push here. Again, Ted probably wouldn't have, but that, I think that plays a part in it. But I still think the Packers are further to the draft and develop end of the spectrum than a lot of other teams. If you notice this free agent period, we could have let go of a lot of guys, but we didn't. We could have let go of Aaron Jones, but instead we, we kind of just re-signed our, our, the majority of our team. And I, I think another thing that's frustrating about it is the Packers did exactly what Tampa Bay did. The difference being Tampa Bay was heralded as being this brilliant, oh my good, it, it, it's amazing how masterful it is for them to have such a good team to be able to pay to bring all their guys back and run it back again. Brilliant, amazing, beautiful, just glorious. Packers did basically the same thing. They had a great football team, solid defense, number one offense in football. They basically brought everybody back except Corey Lindsley. They're going to run it back, and everyone's like, oh, they didn't do anything in free agency. They're so stupid. I hate the Packers. Just double standards because, again, the media doesn't like Green Bay. They don't like... I, I, I don't exactly know how it works. I don't know how their brains work, but that's an issue. But no, I, I still think the general core philosophy is draft and develop. It's find good guys, coach good guys, train good guys, and then pay, the, pay them to stay. And that's what they've done. Homegrown talent. Now, some of them are not uh, the guys that I just listed. But again, we, we were at kind of rock bottom and that we were losing out on talent. And um, it takes a while to rebuild a team. So Gutekunst is like, well... You know, by the time I draft enough guys to fill this team back up, 
Rodgers is going to be gone. So let's just go out and buy a couple, and then we'll start working through the draft. And that's what he did, and he's done a masterful job of that. But since that big, massive you know, hunt down for free agents, it's, it's largely just been retain guys, pay our guys, and um, just stick with that, that general philosophy. But yeah, I, I think as far as the last part of your sentence, it seems like everybody wants immediate results. I think that's true. And I do think the NFL is kind of shifting that way as far as basically players just being recycled. And that's where you see free agency just starting to get crazy. It's, it's, it's becoming Madden. You know, like we're, we're just going to throw these guys away and get new guys. It's like poker. You know, you just you, you take these three guys, throw them out, give me three new cards and see what kind of hand you got. You're seeing a lot more swings at quarterback. Just, you know, we'll, we'll take a swing real early. If it doesn't work, fine. We'll throw them out. We'll get a new one, right? It, it's just, it, it is becoming a lot more volatile and a lot more crazy that way. And, and, and I think that's, the Packers are kind of going with that flow. But again, I still think they're a little bit more on the side of draft and develop. And I think that's a good thing. Got another Patreon question from Josh Rabska. He says, seeing there is a healthy swath of Packer-worthy prospects spread out in the second round and talent tapers off quickly after the third, how much sense would it make if the top-tier fits get grabbed too early for the Packers to trade back out of the first to early second, save their late second-round pick, and bundle a couple other picks to sneak into the mid to late second for a third player of potentially Packers round one caliber? Three second-round picks, maybe a third-rounder, and then some late-round flyer prospects could land us a pretty dang good haul. The only issue I have with this is we're not going to have a third if we do that. The way that that would pan out, and and I don't necessarily hate it. I I kind of like the idea of trading back. Um, I mean, again, it's way too early to call. You'd have to see who's available, but there's not a lot of guys that I look at as being available at the late second round, or excuse me, the late first round, where I think, man, there's no way we could trade back. You know, the, the the classic TJ Watt thing, right? Everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but most Packer fans, myself included, really wanted TJ Watt. We traded back, and it's like, no, we had TJ, dude. I can't think of too many. There might be. There might be where it's like, please, please take that guy, but there's nobody where I would just be furious if we skipped out on them and got somebody else in the second round. Now, it's possible the guy we get in the second round I never liked. But are there going to be guys available if we trade back in the second that I like almost equally or possibly more so than the guys available that are considered late first round prospects? Yes. But the way that this would pan out, let's say we drop back from 29 to about 38. Cincinnati's sitting there, right? Say that there's a whole big thing, and I don't really want to get into it here because it's just, it's not that interesting. Um, the Pene, Pene Sewell thing. And I'm, I'm 100% they need to take Sewell. Very, very popular sentiment that's growing rapidly is forget offensive line. Let's just get more weapons and get more wide receivers. And even though we have two decent wide receivers and our quarterback just got killed last year, and if we lose a quarterback, our team is fried. By the way, this is a very good quarterback, and our number one goal should be to protect him, not even win games or win Super Bowls, protect the quarterback, and then we can focus on getting good later. But whatever. If they don't do that and they just desperately want to get up and get an offensive tackle later, then okay, so we're trading with Cincinnati. We go back to 38. So now we've got pick 38 and pick 62. Uh, But we also picked up a third-round pick in order to move back. That's the compensation that we would get. It would be about a mid-third-round pick. Although Cincinnati doesn't have a mid-third, but whatever, let's pretend they do. We would have to, if we want to trade up into the second round, bundle our two third-round picks, the one we got from Cincinnati and our natural third-round pick, in order to get another late second-round pick. So the way it would work out is we would have pick 38, we would have pick ish, let's say, uh, fifty six, pick sixty two, and then we wouldn't pick again until the late fourth round. Would I? Would I be opposed? I, I think I would. I would rather just not bundle. Now, if you want to possibly move up in the third, because again, there's probably going to be some spillover. It's not just that there's a bunch of good seconds, like you pointed out. It starts to taper after the third round. And that's probably true. And again, we just picked up an additional third. So we would have two seconds and two thirds, and we could possibly move up in the third. So we would have pick, again, pick like 38. We would have pick 62. We would have pick um, whatever I said, like 78, let's say, which is actually Minnesota's, but let's pretend it's Cincinnati's. And then instead of pick 92, let's just say we're kind of running out of second round prospects. We're getting to about pick 80. And it's like, ah, we should maybe move up. We have two fourth-round picks. We could package our second fourth-round pick and move up to about, you know, 82. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, you're not going to get a massive 
haul. But again, I, I, I don't mind the idea of picking up an additional pick because the difference between 29 and, again, 38, I still think we're going to get a stud, and we get an additional third-round player, and I think you're going to get some good players at the early, in the early third-round range. So as much as I'm going to be disappointed because, you know, there's going to be such a massive buildup and it's going to be so exciting to, on Thursday, you know, wait for the pick and then the Packers trade out, but um, I think we'd end up appreciating the haul that we get. Again, it, it's, 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 it's sort of just abstract at this point because we don't know who's available we don't know first of all who's going to be available in the first that changes everything we don't really know who's going to be available in the second much less you know we're, we're contemplating how good the third round's going to be i <laughs> no idea but again generally I, I i don't hate the idea of trading into the second because i i genuinely think and and, I, and that's the other thing i don't know what the packers think they may have a completely different take on this that there's about you know, 27 real good players, and then it just drops off rapidly. So they're looking at it going, we might need to trade up. Whereas we're looking at it going, dude, it's stacked until about pick 75. So we might as well trade back and stack picks in that range. So that that's that's your contention, and that's basically my contention. I have no idea what the Packers think. But, you know, again, we'll wait and see, I guess. All right, I think I'm going to do one more. Um, I had Chris Jacomit. Jacomit. It's like Jacob, but drop the B and add Matt. Jacob Matt. Jacob Matt. Sticking with that, man. That's all I got. That's the that's the best my uh, big, powerful brain can come up with. But he says, I'd like to hear more discussion about late round prospects. Raymond Johnson, defensive end, looks like a monster pick at 220, and the man could be an undrafted free agent since he played in a weak division and has some knocks against his agility. He uh, also went out and listed about 500 other prospects. He'd be interested in hearing about. Um, obviously, not doing that today. But let's uh, let's go ahead and dig into this guy. So as of right now, <laughs> on the consensus big board, Raymond Johnson, and I, I actually know for a fact I've looked at him because um, he's about as low on this board as you can get. Is ranked five hundred and thirty third. So he's about bottom of the barrel. Now he does attend Georgia Southern, so that's kind of what he was referring to as far as small schools. But I will say, guys like this do get me excited also. There's a couple other guys. Um, who was it? I'm never going to find them because there's a billion prospects here. But the cool thing is, I mean, they, they like I said, they just dominate. And they're so much fun to watch. Again, Georgia Southern, very, very small school. But he has got elite all over him. So, again, you got the criteria that I like. Four years, so a lot of experience. 2,213 total snaps. The guy has played a ton. Six foot three, two seventy. He's got a fantastic build. You've got consistency. You've got growth, which is to say he's been good for four years, but he's also got incrementally better over those four years. Seventy one, eighty three, eighty six, and ninety one point nine. This past year, also ninety run defense grade, ninety pass rush grade, forty nine pressures on three hundred and seven attempts, including seven sacks, nine hits, thirty three hurries. But again. All of this is more or less useless. You have to be able to scout and analyze the tape on guys like this because if you took, let's just say Kyler Fackrell, if you took Kyler Fackrell and you put him over there at Georgia Southern, he would have a 95 overall pass rush grade. He probably would have had 15 sacks, right? And so it really just comes down to, okay, so we've learned that you can dominate at this level. Do you have the skills? And that's where you got to start looking at specifics. So to, to give you a specific example, and this is not an example for Raymond Johnson because he's not overly fast, but if you have NFL speed off the edge, there's probably a lot of guys you can just run around at this level. There's nobody. There's not a single NFL tackle you're going to be able to run around. So the question is, what else can you do? You're not going to win with just speed. So unless there's something else to your game, you're going to go from a guy that ran around everybody to a guy that literally can't do anything. But I, I do agree that these are some of the fun guys, especially in the later rounds, because um, you know that they're special players, but they're extremely high risk because they may come into the NFL and just be an absolute joke. So you don't want to touch them in the first few rounds, but you might be getting a gem later on. And to be honest, these are the exact guys that I want to take in the later rounds. There's a lot of guys that are kind of just average across the board or even slightly subpar across the board. And you look at it and say, well... They're never going to be elite players, but if they can just be contributors on a very low level, 
they should be able to at least be in the NFL and be able to be rotational backup guys in a real big pinch. You know, if things really go south, we can put them in. Eh, let's just go with the guys that are either going to be studs or they're not even going to make it to the 53-man roster. They're not even going to make it to the practice squad. We're just going to flat out cut them because <laughs> they're so bad. Let's just swing for the fences, man. But anyways, I am very, very excited about the draft. We've just got a couple days left. Um, I do feel like we're kind of just spinning our wheels. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I love going through these prospects, but I'm ready to just be like, let's just, let's just do this. It's all just fake until we actually get a name, and then it's like, all right, let's go all the way in on this guy. But uh, we got a couple more days, and then we're there. Um, again, I, I'm probably going to be doing more content as far as maybe doing some streaming at night as well. I'm not tonight because I don't feel like it. <laughs> But uh, I do think I have the time and the availability to start doing that. Uh, I just want to ease into it. But I hope that you'll be around and uh, be paying attention and get ready. And again, make sure you get involved in that predict the pick. If you don't see the link anywhere or if I forget to post it again tomorrow, just reach out and be like, dude, I want to do it. I want to win that prize. Hook me up. I'll, I'll get it to you. Message me on Twitter, Facebook, wherever. I don't care. But it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and again, we're going to be uh, going to be live streaming it. So we'll be able to watch. Hopefully, they'll be live scoring it. So we can kind of keep tag along with uh, who the winner is by the end of the night. And that'll make for a really fun night as well as just, I mean, we'll just watch the draft together. But anyways, you guys have yourselves a fantastic Monday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.